Very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm the founding vice chancellor of OP Jindal Global University and dean of Jindal Global Law School. It is indeed a proud privilege of mine to invite all of you to join this uh, fantastic colloquium on the theme justice and the alternative dispute resolution. Uh, the core theme of this afternoon's discussion is arbitration, mediation, and conciliation. Can the COVID-19 crisis reimagine the ADR regime? I have with me a very distinguished set of lawyers from India and also from Australia, and I look forward to introducing them shortly. While COVID-19 started as a health crisis, it has also resulted in shattered economies and societal breakdowns, perhaps the most adverse of our times. The rapid increase in corona cases and continuous extensions in the lockdown period is resulting in increase in demands of justice, from employment issues to potential concerns in liquidity to commercial disputes to even curious cases of the coronavirus diverses, there is a considerable growth in strain in our justice system and the access to justice has become a premium. Given the COVID-19 induced anxiety amongst the masses, the legal responses at this time must be rapid to avoid this medical pandemic from turning into a humanitarian tragedy. While some courtrooms deal with the inertia of moving online, certain courtrooms such as the ones in India face a backlog of course, uh, cases, despite the fact a significant effort has been made to move into virtual and online dispute resolution. Under the current circumstances, ADR methodologies could be a useful tool in expediting justice. Will the time frame of ADR resolution enable us to provide timely justice? Will their modus operandi make their virtualization more feasible? Is this the time to leverage online dispute resolution mechanisms? Will the informal structure of ADR be more conducive in times of COVID-19? What can India and Australia draw from global experiences in evolving their future ADR architecture? This pandemic is an unfortunate opportunity for us to find some of these more fundamental answers and reimagine re the future of justice delivery mechanisms. One where we use ADR more effectively to enable greater levels of justice. Therefore, this colloquium, I hope, is an important platform to address the key question. How does arbitration, mediation, and conciliation fit into the current legal and judicial landscape? And can the COVID-19 crisis reimagine the ADR regime? I have great pleasure in introducing Ms. Pinky Anand, a very distinguished Indian lawyer, designated as a senior advocate, and is also a politician as well. She's serving currently as an additional solicitor of India at the Supreme Court of India. Ms. Anand graduated from Lady Shriram College for Women. In 1979-80, she was elected as the first woman secretary of the Delhi University Students' Union, winning with the highest number of votes. In 1980, she joined the Harvard University to receive a Master of Laws degree supported by INLAC scholarship. Ms. Anand has received several awards for excellence in law, including Fiki and Bharat Dirman, Woman Achiever spokesman for and leading the All India legal team of the Bharatiya Janata Party. Thank you, Pinky, for joining us. Mr. Amarjeet Singh Chindyok is a senior advocate Supreme Court of India and former additional sergeant of India and former president of the Delhi High Court Bar Association. Mr. Chindyok was invited as an expert on Indian laws by various courts and tribunals of the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia. He has received the National Law Day Award 2006 from the Prime Minister of India for the contribution made in the practice of civil law. Welcome to this program, Mr. Chindu. Um, Mr. Siddharth Lutra. Uh, Mr. Siddharth Lutra is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India and the former addition solicitor of India. Mr. Lutra specializes in criminal law, white collar crimes, and cyber frauds. He studied at law at the University of Delhi and then did an MPhil in criminology from the University of Cambridge in 1991. Mr. Lutra is also a member of the Delhi State Legal Service Authority and the vice president of the Indian. In criminal justice society. He also sits on the advisory board of two Indian legal journals, the Delhi Law Times and the Delhi Reported Judgments. Thank you, Siddharth, for joining us in this program. Mr. Parag Tripathi, a very distinguished lawyer, a senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India, and also proudly an honorary adjunct professor at Jindal Global Law School. He is an alumni of Delhi University and Harvard University. Parag has been associated with customs, excise, and other appellate tribunals, company law board, uh, as well as many other commercial arbitrations. His areas of specialization include constitutional law, administrative law, commercial and corporate laws, including both in court litigation and private forum litigations, uh, forums such as arbitration, negotiation, and out of court settlement. And lastly, and not the least, Mr. Dennis Wilson, who's a barrister, mediator, and accredited international arbitrator. 
Victor, whose work generally includes difficult cases in both fact and law, dealing in matters of high value or involving significant principle. He's a long-standing member of the legal profession in Australia and has advised on legislative review and policy development and implementation in environmental law and in the mining and resources sector. Mr. Wilson has a particular interest in the World Trade Organization, the Energy Charter Treaty, mining and oil and gas law, and dispute resolution. Mr. Wilson is an adjunct professor of law at Notre Dame University and also teaches at General Global Law School of General Global University. With that introduction, let me begin by my first question to uh, Parag Tripathi. Parag, COVID-19 is not just a health crisis but is also a humanitarian and economic tragedy. Access to justice and indeed judiciary is important to give respite to individuals suffering from financial, emotional and physical duress. Given the reduced time to resolve disputes, flexibility and cost effectiveness of ADR, will it be better suited to the current times? And also will ADR be more conducive to the changing landscape of this pandemic where we must collaborate to find justice, Parag. Yeah, Professor, uh, I agree that these are very dark times indeed. I don't think though that COVID gives any additional edge or benefit necessarily to ADR. It does give a benefit in the sense that ADR, approach to ADR is less formal than an approach to a formal court system. But I think our courts are trying to particularly in India, and I'm sure rest of the world, Australia and rest of the world as well, are trying to uh, meet this new challenge to justice delivery system by utilizing uh, uh, the electronic media and to use the various platforms which are now available. The problem really comes in uh, because uh, I call it a generational problem. A certain generation of lawyers and judges feel comparatively ill at ease with this new methodology. Now that problem will continue whether you do it on a court or in an ADR platform. So we have to uh, get more familiar with, with the new platforms. And once we do that, I personally don't see any reason uh, why both our ju justice delivery system, the traditional one, and the ADR system uh, would work Fine, there would be initial hiccups for sure. There's a very in instructive judgment of the Federal Court of Australia, I was going through it by one Perum Justice, where there was an application for adjournment in the formal legal system saying that because of the problem of COVID, we can't go on. He rejected the uh, adjournment uh, motion and pointed out seven sets of problems which the system faces. He said technological limitations, because he said there was one witness who was in a sheep farm in Australia and they couldn't hear him. So they had to adjourn the hearing, right? So this is a problem. Physical separation of legal teams, expert witness, lay witness, document management, future issues and trial length and expense. So these are issues which I think will be common to both. And he uh, makes uses a very felicitous phrase when he says, and I'd like to quote that, he says, receiving whilst in full flight a WhatsApp message with a document attached to it is not the same experience as having one's gown tugged and a piece of paper thrust in front of oneself. So I think it's not, I don't think COVID makes any sea change in ADR versus the normal justice system. Perhaps ADR is a little simpler to approach, particularly now with emergency arbitration. What it requires is a sea change in the way the lawyers and judges think and react. Thank you. Thank you very much, Parag, for setting the stage for our discussion as well. Uh, for all the panelists and viewers, we have over 1,500 people who have registered for this program. We are live on Facebook and YouTube. After the first segment of this conversation, I will be taking up questions. So for all those viewers, please send in, our quest send in your questions and we will get back to it. All right, let me move to Dennis. Dennis, uh, I would like you to give a little bit of overview of the Australian dispute resolution mechanism, and in particular to talk about the larger context of how litigation and dispute resolution are coming together, not just in the current extraordinary times, but even before COVID. Dennis. Thank you. Uh, the uh, dispute resolution system in Australia is uh, 
thriving. It's important to remember that the rule of law is crucially important and the maintenance of the rule of law is important. You have courts moving into online systems and that will continue, I think. And I think it will continue in under the umbrella of the rule of law. Of course, mediation and arbitration, commonly referred to as alternate dispute resolution, is by agreement between the parties. And there is a, a symbiosis between the judicial system and alternate dispute resolution. The judicial system acts as more than a clearinghouse to send matters to alternate dispute resolution. Although it is crucially important to have the alternate dispute resolution regime or practices in place because it takes pressure off of the court system. There is no uh, significant mandatory system of going to alternate dispute resolution. Of course, as the listeners will know, uh, arbitration, uh, if that is chosen as the method, means you don't go to court by and large, except going to court to support the arbitration. And vice versa, if you go to court, then you don't go to arbitration unless the parties by agreement get there eventually. Uh, but they are thriving, they're not compulsory, they're by agreement. In circumstances where matters do go to mediation by order of the court, which is possible, then that order of the court requires parties to engage in mediation in good faith. And any agreement reached at mediation maintains its voluntariness. So that with those recognized indicia of alternate dispute resolution and the court system, it, it is vibrant. Thank you, Dennis. Um, well, that's obviously very useful from the standpoint of what kind of experiences India has. Let me move to Pinky. Uh, Pinky, you are, of course, in the panel, uh, the, uh, the serving law officer of the government of India. Uh, you happen to be the ASG as well. So now the question is, with over three crore ca cases pending across the Indian courts, uh, we have had this conversation about to what extent ADR can help in overcoming the backlog. Uh, will it be a more sustainable way of ensuring timely disposal of cases? Uh, what are the advantages of, let's say, a multi-tiered ADR process? And uh, do you think organizations like the Indian Council of Arbitration or similar other organizations can play a role? And to what extent this can be seen as a solution that goes beyond a COVID-19 fix. Please, Pinky. Uh, thanks, Raj. I think you have addressed quite a few questions rolled into possibly one <laughs> on the surface, but is multi-tiered by all means. Um, having said that, uh, I think these are extremely interesting questions and COVID-19 has actually thrown them open to us. Um, when I was looking at the questions yesterday, in fact, I, I must say that Parag has more or less stated what I would have stated. Now, sitting back and saying, you know, it's very easy to say that one system of uh, dispute resolution, in this present case, ADR, is uh, possibly better suited to the normal litigation. But I concur with what Parag said to that in that respect to say, basically, they are the same, same in a sense of purposes for disposal of a case. So it's not any further advantages that COVID lends to the situation, but the inherent advantages of ADR which are there. And in fact, I think one of the most uh, important reasons for the preference of ADR is the fact that it is more informal by nature. Uh, and, and I think that lends itself to a virtual world much easier than the um, litigation court oriented system because courts do have, there's one issue of open access, for example, in courts, which is still plaguing everybody aside from possibly a couple of others, which we have talked about. That open justice system is not really needed within the domain of ADR, because in any case, by its very nature, it lends itself to the parties in particular. So I think that as well as the formality required in, in court litigation is something which is possibly not there in ADR. So these are some of the inherent advantages aside, of course, from the usual cost effectiveness, 
disposal being faster because we as a as a government as a country have actually facilitated the arbitration and adr to be a much more speedier system than uh, what possibly the court litigation systems have been but i must say that we've been asking for it in the sense that it has been a uh, high time and we've often uh, addressed this system of you know judicial reforms in order to expedite so you have uh, issues like for example written arguments which is something which has been time been wanting uh, for a long time you have issues of limitation of arguments for time uh, now that is something also which we need to possibly consider curtailing and i i would say that even as lawyers uh, some of us find it hard to accept these things but at the same time how else would you achieve disposal uh, please take another issue which i would raise here in respect to the virtual world and courts today for various reasons of course it also includes access within these troubled and critical times you have a very very small number of cases which are being taken up over here and of course these are the initial hiccuping periods and this would uh, increase in course of time but at the same time we are facing quite a crisis so having said this the multi tiered system that you talked about which is negotiation mediation and arbitration serves a very big purpose and i'll tell you why in fact particularly in the commercial world in the commercial world people want contracts to continue and particularly i'm talking about long term infrastructural kind of projects nobody wants them to go neither uh, the one of the party none of the parties want that to go and you want it to continue so if you want a situation to continue in that case possibly the mediation and negotiation is a very important component and we in fact have been recommending a relook at these existing situations so that they can be negotiated a way out now that exactly is a multi tiered approach that you are talking about and it would be in everybody's interest because economic uh, losses which are facing us uh, across the globe as well as in the country the only manner of addressing them is to ensure that businesses and economy continues to flourish as much as it can within the circumstances and there is as less discord as possible to have less discord you need to pay more attention which we are in any case paying increasingly to mediation and negotiation and on a, another front i would just mention for example we recognize this feature even in our commercial disputes act there is a pre litigation um, uh, mediation that is in fact mandated under the act except for very urgent cases so it has been in the coming i think what covid 19 has ensured is that we are now focusing on it and we are paying more attention to those details which otherwise possibly would have taken a somewhat more time in order to address thank you very much pinky uh, for this um let me move to uh, mr chandyok mr chandyok uh, given significant disruptions uh, that are taking place including lockdowns uh, disrupting the local supply chain management uh, commercial disputes will significantly occupy a lot of litigation in the future but no certainty about the future how long will the force majeure clauses protect organizations affected due to the pandemic will arbitration conciliation and mediation become the new form of litigation and arguably is it time to drop the word alternative from the alternative dispute resolution terminology thank you rajmar the question that i must bring home to you first of all is that in india today as i think pinky pointed out just now we an amended the commercial courts act in 2018 to bring a mandatory pre litigation mediation it has worked wonders at least so far as i know about it with connected to mediation to some extent that we did lot of this and about 62% matters got resolved at pre litigation stage itself our request now and i think the probably the government is already considering this part to if we can amend section 89 of the code of civil procedure and make mandatory in pre litigation in every kind of proceeding if we can bring mediation first and i want to share with this august gathering that in the last 10 days at least five different parties have approached some of us who are mediation to say if they can sit down or sit down virtually i mean to say and resolve their dispute now this is the today the commercial world is looking at it needs to sit down and resolve whether it's cross border or whether it's within the country to see how we can resolve because unless we resolve those disputes <clears throat> we will not be able to have come back to our economy back we will not be able to provide to employment to people 
and therefore ultimately we are violating what we either we are saving lives on one hand but you have to also save those who will not die of starvation tomorrow if that we don't save that therefore i think the best part of this development that is taking place in india is that today a commercial world is looking at going to a mediation or even sitting together because in mediation you will have empathy you will have negotiation you will be able to give out what you want to say and with respect to force major clause i have seen now in two cases so the there was no force major earlier but party sat down and we brought a force major clause because of the covid 19 situation because ultimately force major is a contract between the parties of the contracts did not provide for it and nobody thought there will be one day covid so they came together to need to negotiate their agreement only to the extent of providing force major to that extent therefore the situation is changing and i'm sure court is already taking cognizance of it we are working there's a teething problem there's no doubt but i can share this development and i think it's a very good development that is happening both in commercial and in fact we have a matrimonial dispute as you said covid 19 is bringing more divorces we have a matrimonial dispute with one of our mediators today who is looking at is with respect to the custody of the child and both of them are not one is outside the country one is in the united kingdom so these are situations which are now happening and i think these are very healthy developments and i only want to share one thing else to with all this august gathering each one of us including me says there's a lot of backlog in our country the courts are not able to do it i take it in a different way to mar and to all of you that unless people still have faith in my judicial system if they had no faith they will not knock the doors of the court and therefore it's a healthy sign to see that the rule of law is still prevalent in this country and we are able to do this and i think all steps are being taken in that direction and we all stakeholders must join hands today we should not look at nobody is perfect i will have 20 disadvantages and 10 advantages maybe look at those advantages that you can take from each other join hands to ensure in these trying times we are able to do something which will show sympathy empathy communicate listen to people in fact listening is something which we must learn in covid 19 how do we listen to people if we listen to people i think we will resolve most of our problems listening Thanks, is sir. apparently losing its sense and if we bring that listening back we'll be able to develop thank you very much thank you very much mr chandyog for striking a very important optimistic note about some of the challenges that we are facing truly these are extraordinary times and that degree of hopefulness is critical uh, let me move to uh, siddarth uh, siddarth uh, you, you know it will be nice if you can reflect some of your views on the effectiveness of india's arbitration and conciliation act especially in the context of the current uh, pandemic uh, as we all know the supreme court recently took so much cognizance of the limitation period clause uh there there are number of other possible innovations uh, that we need to do uh, for you know creating a different type of adr architecture uh, possibly uh, given your vast experience of you know dealing with international issues what can we be imbibing from let's say australia's uh, international arbitration act or other global experiences given uh, the relatively friendly stance which uh, some of the international courts have taken to what extent this can be seen as an opportunity for india to provide leadership in creating uh, institutional mechanisms for promoting uh, you know uh, adr in a more stronger and a more substantive manner uh, in addition to an indep independent of our uh, you know court based uh, dispute resolution mechanisms siddharth raj uh, as you said every crisis gives rise to great opportunities and this is one such crisis and for me from in my view the opportunities is, exist now for adr in a very big way let me just share with you a couple of numbers you know our courts had budgets they were given budgets to uh, developed to implement technology but my understanding is that about 40% of that budget has been utilized at the highest by any high court and that is a serious concern and that is the reason you would have seen that from the time the lockdown began in india there has been an attempt to ramp up infrastructure and today courts are working at about 40 to 50 percent efficiency it's taken two months but it's still a long way to go there was in the end of april a uh, consultation by the government i had occasion to be part of that as to how to reopen the court system and how to redress the you know the the 
uh, access to justice. And one of the biggest concerns is you've opened the Supreme Court. It's working. It does about, each bank does about 25, 30 matters a day, which is great, which used to be 50 earlier. You've reopened the high courts, but what do you do about trials? Original side matters are not happening, whether on the civil or the criminal side or the commercial side. So we are faced with a situation where the rules recently, the Delhi High Court has come out with rules, other high courts are coming out with rules, but we have, uh, we, we seem to be frozen in time. Now that's the concern. So far as ADR is concerned, if we look at the international experience, we have an advantage, two advantages, which I may say, arbitration ADR has inbuilt infrastructures which exist, which can be applied to dispute resolution. ADR is fast, it's efficacious, it's logical in a time of economic tragedies when people want a resolution of disputes and they want a final conclusion because it should be resolved either which way people don't have the funds and the resources. There is also the issue of the fact that these can be, it can be document-based. Your law, your R Act recognizes document-based arbitrations. Today, people are willing to go for that. So it is time for us to relook at these mechanisms and have more effective institutional mechanisms to ensure that it's faster, it's cost effective, it's result oriented in terms of time bound. And even I, I will see, I believe that there are also, even the agreements for arbitration are now going to be recalibrated to require only sole arbitrators to provide time bound arbitration so things are much faster. So far as the international experience is concerned, whether we look at Australia and other countries, what we really need to imbibe from these international experiences is that there needs to be a greater referral and a greater referral to of disputes to arbitrations. And as uh, Mr. Chandyok talked about that, he mentioned certain instances of mediation being brought about in different uh, areas of work. It's important to take more out of the court system, reduce the numbers in the court system and give people access to justice. Because if we don't do that, I don't see the courts reopening for a year, maybe longer. I don't see the courts reopening till we have a cure. And while the courts seek to ramp up their infrastructure, it's ADR's opportunity, it's institutional arbitration's opportunity, and we must progress. I think the government, as Pinky said, the government is also looking at it. It was discussed in that, uh, in that consultation, is looking at it seriously to consider how much more can be offloaded outside the conventional court system. Thank you very much, uh, Siddharth, for that uh, very candid set of observations. Uh, let me move to Parag. Uh, Parag, uh, you know, given the current state of business disruptions, uh, what can parties do, let's say, to minimize the cost of potential dispute resolution, even while drafting the contracts? The real question is what innovative uh, techniques can be used to draft, uh, you know, dispute resolution cl clauses to lower uh, the dispute cost over it. Because at the end of the day, uh, today with this crisis, uh, the reality is companies and corporations are under stress. Uh, they're conscious of all kinds of costs. And one of the things that they're conscious of, at least in the Indian context, is the potential resolution, both in terms of litigation and delays that might arise out of it. So what can they do as they think about the future? Professor, I believe it was Frankfurter who had once said, the golden rule of interpretation is read the statute, read the statute, read the statute. These are the three golden rules. For Indian parties, what has to be drilled in is read the contract, read the contract, read the contract. Most Indian parties, both private and public sector undertakings, when they want a contract, they just sign. They don't follow up the clauses, unless it's a one-sided contract, which is a standard form of contract of a public sector undertaking. Later on, when they develop problems, then they try to fit in their understanding with the clause. This is very different from the view, say, of a British company or an American company, and I'm sure an Australian company, which will take maximum time drafting the contract. So you have to be very careful, and you have to remember that this draft, this contract you're signing, is like the old Hindu marriage. You are going to continue with the spouse forever. There's no question of a divorce. You can't come out of it. That has to be drilled in to our, our Indian parties particularly. It's of course changing, but that's very important. Secondly, I think uh, taking a cue from what uh, Mr. Chandyok said, 
maybe put in a clause for mediation or trying to solve an issue by mediation. Go a step better and point, appoint a mediator or set out that this would be our mediator if possible. Because there are some mediators who are very, very good. Thirdly, I think, if you are going for an arbitration clause, try and limit it to one arbitrator. I have never understood the benefit in the Indian scenario of three arbitrators. It means three sets of diaries, three sets of dates which are not convenient, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, in India, and that's my request to our arbitrators, several of whom are very distinguished retired judges, and there's some very good lawyers or arbitrators too, that please remove yourself from the umbilical cord of which party has nominated you. Because that's very fundamental to the integrity of the system. All our arbitrators, well, not all, there's some glorious exceptions, but several of our distinguished arbitrators feel that there's an umbilical cord, moral umbilical cord, which links them to the client who nominated them. Now that's very different from international arbitration where I will of course remember that Professor Rajkumar is the party which nominated me, but I won't let that come in, certainly not when I'm conducting the arbitration and also not when I'm giving my final wording. Having said so, I think what is required is a greater sensitivity of commercial parties to the stands of each other and a greater focus that litigation or even arbitration will not solve all problems. So I think there has to be a change in approach, a greater sensitivity to go about solving problems. Having said so, this doesn't always work. So if you are up against a government body, typically a government body in India, the flexibility which that body has to do a settlement out of court is very, very limited. So you have to then probably go for litigation or arbitration, as the case may be. Thank you very much, Parag. Uh, Dennis, let me move to you in the, in the little bit reflect on the international context. Now, these uh, disruptions that are taking place are also affecting the international supply chain. Uh, what do you think will be the impact of it on international commercial arbitration? Uh, do you anticipate the outcome of these cases to be affected by COVID-19 and uh, xenophobia? Uh, for example, uh, just several, um, I think uh, several weeks ago, Apple announced that it will, it's planning to move some of its operations from uh, China to India. And uh, very quickly, the US president uh, announced that uh, Apple will face significant tax penalty for such a thing. And there are many other areas which are also uh, possibly being affected. W2 has predicted that world merchandise trade could fall between 13 to 32% this year. So how can this affect the future demand for international arbitration? The future demand for international arbitration is uh, uh, only going to increase. It's only going to increase. Looking at it from the point of view of the corporations, it's crucially important to disassociate profit margins from cash flow. And in so many cases now, the important issue will be cash flow in terms of this COVID-19 tragedy, stopping cash flow. What is the consequence of that for arbitration and indeed mediation? It must mean that arbitration has to lift its game, not only to become more efficient in its administration, but to determine cases more quickly, because unless a dispute is determined quickly, the cash flow isn't going to follow. And as a consequence, uh, uh, not only is arbitration going to increase, uh, but it's also going to be forced by virtue of the corporations who take advantage of arbitration to become more efficient. And there are various ways in which that can be done and they can be discussed. The other question arises, that arises is how will it be uh, increased in its efficiency, that is alternate dispute resolution. And the answer will, will be in the drafting of the dispute resolution clauses. 
they're going to be escalating dispute resolution clauses from negotiation, mediation to arbitration. There is going to be an increasing requirement for emergency arbitration. And there's going to be an increasing requirement for a one panel arbitrator. And I totally agree that in most cases, having three arbitrators is a nonsense. Mm -hmm. It's a nonsense from the point of view of the cost in, and the amount in issue. And it's a nonsense from the point of view of the cost of the arbitration itself. And it's a nonsense from the point of view of the efficiency of the arbitration. And that must be grappled with. And if that involves uh, an appointment of an arbitrator by an independent body, then that may be a solution, although I don't know if it's a, a total or correct solution. But uh, in determining a dispute by three arbitrators, uh, in most cases, is simply not necessary. Thank you very uh, much. But Sorry, go ahead. Yes. Sorry, go ahead, please. Yes, it's it's it, it, it's simply not necessary, uh, and it and it has to be addressed. Okay. Uh, it can be addressed in various ways, including the efficiencies of the directions given at arbitration and getting down to the real issues and requiring the parties to work harder not simply putting forward volumes and volumes of paper, which is very often the case, but by refining that paper to the real issues so that they can hone in to become more efficient overall. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, we are live on Facebook and YouTube for all those who have just joined us. You can send in your questions after the first part of this discussion gets over. I will take up the questions that uh, uh, some of you might share. Uh, Pinky, uh, now, as the comforting conceit that the state of emergency declared is time bound and that in that particular framework uh, is going to fade, legal systems are resorting to the virtual world. What are your views on online dispute resolution? Is the transition uh, from ADR to ODR going to be the future of, uh, you know, these frameworks of dispute resolution? Should we anticipate a rise in online dispute resolution platforms such as uh, Kader and Sama in India, what could be the possible transition for the future? Um, Raj, I think you have uh, nailed the right issue because what is happening is there is requirement as we have discussed over various platforms and multi-tier as much as the methodology which is to be adopted in resolving disputes. And since the entire basis, there are two aspects of this. One is a time issue, uh, in fact, three. The second is the economic issue. And the third is the efficacy of the process. So when we talk about uh, ODR, it itself actually emphasizes a quicker resolution. And of course, the virtual world uh, as, as a concomitant, as a necessary uh, predicament as far as that is concerned, as a, as a built-in condition. So you really have that as a, as a prerequisite for ODR. With that in hand and the way ODR has been handled, I think it is particularly well-suited for issues such as commercial disputes uh, where you really have the entire process which is adopted for discussion, the chat rooms, the breakaway rooms and the entire process by having virtual filing. Uh, I think it takes into account, uh, in a way, the same systems in, in others, for example, ADR or in litigation, but it is more structural and therefore it lends itself easier to the adoption and resolution of disputes in that manner, which includes the same multi-tier process. So we have seen the coming up of a number of platforms. We, you have mentioned a couple of them, and I think they've been fairly successful. Um, I must also mention at this point, sorry, guys, last time you had asked me about the uh, Indian Council of Arbitration. Now that body itself of 1965, which is almost 400 uh, domestic and international disputes, I think is doing a, a very fantastic job, I must say, in trying to uh, ensure the arbitration, then it is in fact very cost effective. So uh, I thought I would mention that because we must have kudos for particularly, I think the importance of institutions. And I think also there, the setting up of the Arbitration Council of India, which, which is really would set up not only the standards for the arbitration, but for the arbitrators. And particularly now we have the virtual world kind of component. So each of these, which would be added in fact, similarly to, for example, ICC. ICC is conducting all its international arbitrations by the virtual platforms. Uh, and I think we need to understand that these technologies which have become available 
the the quicker we adapt to them and to get over as uh, chandyog said to the original hiccups and come up to the current times i i think we need to do that so what we might land up is really a hybrid of systems but at the same time to step few steps fast forward so that we have the faster systems in hand as well as utilize the existing systems within that structure to make it not only multi tiered within one particular domain but to make it a hybrid of that multi tiered system thank you very much uh, pinky uh, let me move to mr chandyok uh, mr chandyok we have been talking a lot about particularly about arbitration and uh, i want to ask you a question a bit more on the mediation side of it now mediation as you know is a very intimate form of dispute resolution highly skilled mediators often need to lower the emotional temperature of negotiations and even foster effective communication between the parties involved given the personal touch required in this format how effective will it be in a virtual group what techniques uh, should mediators utilize to make the e mediation process productive the heart of mediation clearly is a certain degree of trust and how this trust can be fostered in a e mediation context so it's of course a different world altogether in virtual situation when you are dealing with person to person the the trust that you create by negotiation or what listening as i said earlier itself creates the trust between the parties but with the time that we are changing today there's no the choice but why only first part that i'm looking at is this that like we saw in ppe for example the moment we the india thought we need some more ppes everybody whether he thought the cloth was required not required required for something else he started manufacturing ppe so my worry today is you will get platforms after platforms for arbitration and mediations therefore you need to put standards in place we must put those standards in place so that this comes first hand to us so that who is coming to that mediation or arbitration is the first request that i need to look at the second part is how do i create that trust even with respect to virtual hearing it is possible for us to give probably little more time than probably would i would do the joint sessions will have to be probably more effective on virtual and i see that point today that we'll have to change our system adopt to virtual by holding those caucus meetings separately to understand what is the underlying meaning of the person and as i think prag said earlier contract need to be read we have a very living example of it that vodafone's matter where the arbitration or the conciliation said you will be governed by english arbitration act kurian law will be ancestral law place of arbitration shall be malaysia but indian law will govern it so for all these years we have been doing so therefore even in virtual thing what kind of agreement we should have what should be placed before the mediator people what all should come before the mediator and the greatest challenge that we have is confidentiality because you will face that problem somebody may be recording it somebody may be doing something else somebody may take screenshots but i must also share with this audience that the mediation legislation is on its move we expect the mediation legislation to come very fast if that comes in place and takes forward note of all this i am sure these problem will be overcome how fast we will be able to move that i think the supreme court is also looking at it the committee is looking at it i am sure mm -hmm. in times to come we will be obli able to do this but regulation is important today so far as even mediation is concerned and today after singapore convention on mediation enforcement i think it's time that we must incorporate that also and see that even the negotiated settlements in mediation are itself enforceable i no need to look at part 3 of the arbitration consideration act section 74 thank you very much mr chandyok uh, uh, let me um, move to sadat sadat i know you've been like others you've been appearing before our courts in an online manner in a virtual manner so what are the challenges that mediators and conciliators and arbitrators anticipate in migrating to the online world what kind of infrastructural support would be required to enable them to do so uh, in a in a smooth uh, uh, transition mode uh, also do you see a social digital divide in access to justice with large part of the population in a country like india being constrained by limited resources technical skills infrastructure i mean the small and medium enterprises to what extent those type of disputes can actually come into this framework so that uh, first of all uh, my experience from the courts has taught me that from the beginning when we had uh, very rudimentary infrastructure 
it's changed over the over time and it's now almost seamless as i said in the supreme court a typical bench is doing 25 30 matters a day and it's quite seamless you're in a lobby we even get to chat in the lobby and smile at each other once in a while share a quip and then we go on to hearings but that's the court system so far as arbitration is concerned adr my view is that the infrastructure to shift arbitration online exists because parties who are going there voluntarily have even in the past proceeded with hearings in the virtual world through video conferencing and that system exists and it is much more adaptable if you look at you know the provisions of the indian arbitration act which is similar to other laws you know there is there is as i said an opportunity to do arbitration only document based arbitrations now all of these ensure that we can use arbitration in a much more effective way. The problem, as you rightly pointed out, is of cost. Commercial transactions, by and large, people are happy to go there because what you lose in terms of costing, you gain in terms of the enhanced cost of an arbitration, you gain in terms of time. Today, people want a resolution. They want to settle, people want to conciliate, and that is going to increase as uh, Dennis Wilson said, there's going to be a great increase in this area of work because with the economic disruption that has taken place, people want to close matters as fast as possible. Having said that, there is a divide, but that divide will have to be overcome. And it is time for our bar bodies to, to discuss with government, to discuss with the, the limited the institutional arbitration that we have, for example, ICA and others to set up systems where not only you can have places for a uh, lawyers to access remote locations and then carry out an arbitration or arbitrators to access from remote locations. And secondly, also opportunities to provide trials. I was going through some of the protocols, the sole protocol, and I find that there are issues that need to be addressed in terms of how witnesses are going to be secured how you're going to provide an environment where there has to be an observation. There is a need for an observation of witness because you don't want witnesses to be interfered with or tutored. Now, these are all fundamental infrastructural issues. There is also an issue of access of technology, as you pointed out. So the technology available, let's say in, in Delhi, would not be available in some of our hill states. And whenever there's a storm, you find the Wi-Fi, collapsing, Wi-Fi systems collapsing there because of the peculiar weather patterns we have there. So all of this needs to be ramped up in a big way. Fortunately, in India, we've, we went digital a long time ago, and we have a lot of infrastructure in place. It's just that between the government, between the courts, between the institutions of arbitration, we have to try and set up these regional hubs. And if we do that, perhaps India may end up being a very attractive destination for arbitrations, and we may be able to achieve things which we have not been able to do so far. Thank you very much, Siddharth. Um, well, to all the viewers here, we are uh, live on Facebook and YouTube and send in your questions. Very shortly, we'll be moving into the Q&A segment. Um, let me go to, um, let me push uh, a bit more uh, with Parag. Uh, Parag, one of the things that we are facing is that every crisis has an opportunity. And so it'll be, it'll be very useful for lawyers like you, and I'm going to ask this question to all of you, is that what are the key reform initiatives that the COVID-19 crisis can propel when it comes to building a more robust ADR regime in India? And what could be the role of the lawyers, uh, particularly those lawyers who have a, a certain type of legal practice who appreciate the importance of ADR, how they can influence and even inform uh, policy and legal and institutional reforms in this area. I'm going to ask that question to each one of you, uh, and I, it will be very useful for our audience to have your reflections on that. Parag. Professor, I think uh, as far as making ADR more effective uh, in the context of COVID or even otherwise, what is required is one or two uh, mindset changes. You see, uh, we started from the old English case of Dolman where they said that it's even if a party enters into an arbitration agreement, the party can always file a suit. And that's it. 
unless the arbitration agreement has been entered in a court. Now we have moved away from there. But in many of our high courts and in the Supreme Court, uh, we don't have really a dedicated bar for arbitration. Now, you can't have it overnight. But the problem which happens as a consequence is most arbitrations are weekend affairs. So all the top arbitral tribunals have chock-a-block on Saturdays and even Sundays and evenings of days. Where COVID gives you an opportunity is that even though Siddharth said that uh, the courts are functioning uh, with, a, with a reasonable board, but obviously final hearings of the kind we had earlier are not happening in any of the courts really, with, with very few exceptions and very few matters. Therefore, now the availability of lawyers is much more. So the timings which you are getting in ADR slots are all morning timings. Now, that unfortunately may not survive or get over COVID. But I think consciously we have to take a call. I think ultimately what we need is a shift away from actual court to a virtual court, from actual tribunals to virtual tribunals. The great advantage there is that the time which is spent between matters can be usefully enjoyed and employed. So I think that is the way we have to look at. And there is one more aspect. Many times, and I was reading a very nice article, which said that arbitral tribunals suffer from a due process paranoia. The due process paranoia is that unless I'm very liberal with my time management uh, module with parties, one of the parties will raise a ground in the court when the award is challenged that they did not get enough opportunity, adequate opportunity to present the case. So what is required is a degree of robustness as well, uh, both um, from the tribunal and from the courts. Again, and I'll just touch it for a second. There is also in international commercial arbitration, a small but very, uh, uh, very powerful group of authors who say that in international arbitrations even today, and I know this is a very unpopular view in an arbitration friendly setup, but international arbitrations even today have a bias against the developing world. But that's an issue uh, which has nothing to do with COVID and that's an issue which I think is resolving itself over time. But that's another aspect which probably has to be looked into. Thank you. Thank you very much, Parag. Dennis, same question to you, but you can also add to what extent the lack of mobility, for example, I mean, international travel has been almost uh, uh, banned. So to what extent the lack of international mobility in itself is going to impact the world of international commercial arbitration, in addition to the... The lack of international mobility should not uh, impact on arbitration. I'm sitting here in Sydney and there's a four and a half hour time difference if I was doing an arbitration in India, it would be a very little effort for me to uh, obviate suffering jet lag by going to India and doing it from here and uh, getting up at two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning or whatever the parties wanted. It's little sacrifice. In fact, it's no sacrifice at all. Uh, that's number one. Number two, in making it uh, workable, uh, it, 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 it lies in its efficiency and it has to be grasped and it has to be looked at from the point of view of the consumer of arbitration and the desperate state that a lot of the consumers are in. They need their disputes resolved quickly and it's going to assist in the wheels of industry turning quickly or efficiently. And that is crucially important. And so the processes of arbitration have to be improved as well, including the directions given early opening statements, et cetera, et cetera, which can only assist. And also impressing upon the parties that engaging in negotiation or mediation is a, a no brainer. It adds to cost very little. It doesn't take up more time. It occurs during the process. And there's absolutely no reason why those aspects should not be made more efficient. And from the point of view of technology, uh, it should not be lost sight of that practitioners, for example, myself, if I was going to engage in a large arbitration, I would make sure that I was not the one who was going to be 
over the technology, I would have some technology person assisting me in that so that I can be assured that it's going to function efficiently. And uh, that's important because it's important for us as arbitrators to get down to the substance of the matter uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Denise. Uh, Pinky, uh, the question is for you, is the same question which I asked Parag, what are the possible reform initiatives that we can have uh, in relation to promoting a stronger and a more robust ADR regime? Uh, I'll tell you, I think the ADR regime is on its way to improvement and has been so for some time. Uh, I think the principal change, aside from structural changes and providing more infrastructure, which some of the speakers have mentioned, is obviously something which is inherently wanted. But I'll just add two features to it. One, I think the necessity to try to make more contracts arbitration bound, ADR bound. Uh, I think we are still uh, at points not having sufficient uh, mandate within those contracts to have arbitration as a mode of resolution. And I say, sorry, arbitration, but I mean the multi tiered approach, which is obviously necessitated. The second, which I think is a very important component, is, is the mindset change. I think the, our regard for due process of law, as one of the speakers had said, uh, in this country is very high. Now, due process of law doesn't mean that there must be uh, lawyers um, arguing for hours on end in order to demonstrate that there is an efficacious case or some kind of satisfaction. I think what we have to look at is a resolution of disputes as a primary target. So the due process of law uh, concept itself needs the hybrid adjustment, not only for uh, one section of the justice delivery system, but in particular for uh, the consumers. Uh, and I think everybody has realized today that we are looking at something which is a quicker resolution, both in terms of time, because time is money, and in terms of cost, because ultimately it does save. And I'll add one third feature. I think it, it must be understood that litigation should be costly. The idea is not that litigation should not be available. Open access to justice is one part. Access to justice is one part. Access to all is one part. But at the same time, it must be understood that litigation itself is a costly process in all manners. And I think that might change the, uh, the, the contours of this entire debate. Uh, and to that extent, I think the Western world, you find it uh, a far more greater exercise to engage in these exercises. And in terms of the fact that we've turned commercial, I mean, uh, whatever may be the current situation under COVID-19, but India has done dramatically well in terms of economic performance and world rankings. So I think in that respect, if we actually move towards uh, a mindset which veers itself to resolution of disputes, even after mediation or negotiation, is something that would give us a jump start uh, on access to justice itself. Thank you very much, Pinky. Mr. Chandiyog, please. I have a to now put a responsibility on myself first, I think the first reform that I need is within myself as counsel. We'll have to change our mind from everything adversarial to see, especially if you see an example in Singapore, even in arbitration, after the pleadings are completed in the time schedule given, parties are sent to mediation. This is one part. But I am on a different process. We should have a concept like a case management. If I know the pleadings now, I would at least know my party's case best. And if I find out of the pleadings, I can resolve two issues with Prague on my own, then I should be able to offer that position to Prague so that we both sit down and at least resolve five, two out of five issues and leave three to the arbitral tribunal to decide. Wherever we find we can bring relationship back, wherever we can resolve ourselves, I think that's a first change that I need to need change within ourselves and within the community. I don't need any other reforms. I need to reform myself first. And then comes where the arbitral tribunal finds that something can be resolved between the parties. I think it should also make a attempt to do that in terms of the mandate of section 30 itself. It says it's not incompatible to have a resolution. If you are able to reduce that issues between the parties, I think the arbitration process itself would take a speed, it will go leaps and bounds. Apart from emergency arbitration, you will itself be able to do that part. And if parties can be made to in counsel sit down, because he will know the best case. If out of five, two, three are issues are decided, then I think we have made a resolution. So my request would be, I need to resolve some resolution to myself first. And I also want to at least use this forum where so many large number of people are on this that we who are seniors in our professions 
now to give a lead to our junior colleagues to show them that we also do something pro bono. And I think there are community situations where we must lend our hand to ensure resolve, resolution of disputes can be done and offer our services without there being a compulsion on us to do so. If that process can be changed within our community, I think we will be a long way to have access to justice to a poor and to people who are not able to afford it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chandiyok. Uh, Siddharth. Okay, uh, I must tell you, what is it that a litigant looks at? After all, we're in the service. We're in, I really believe that we're in a service industry and we must understand that. A litigant comes to us for resolution. A litigant wants expeditious resolution. Conciliation, mediation are the first step forward. The second thing which I want to tell you is that the world has changed and as was said earlier, it's time that the bodies of institution promote ODR. We must also understand that we have to drop the word alternative from ADR. It should now be in complementary to the system. It is no longer an alternative. It is going to be a major part of our system and therefore complementary or supplementary is the case maybe. That's the way forward. The third part, which Dennis Wilson said, it's a very interesting thing. We are all sitting in our homes or in our offices, as the case may be, and doing matters at different jurisdictions. I've done matters in different high courts in the last few weeks, and it's, it's a fascinating experience. Having said that, one of the things we must understand is the cost should naturally come down. If I can sit and do an arbitration or a hearing from Delhi, whereas otherwise I would have to travel, I'm saving time of travel, cost of travel, inconvenience, and frankly, that's inconvenience maybe to me, but it's the client who's paying for it. So that entire ecosystem is now changing. And according to me, COVID-19's lockdown brings an opportunity to make justice and resolution seamless across the globe. The concerns of uh, distance are no longer relevant. And what is imperative is, our institutional bodies, especially in India and overseas, must disseminate this concept of access to resolution. And if they don't do it, they'll be failing in their duty. This is the golden opportunity for all of them. And if unless this education of, of is done, not only amongst the lawyers, but also amongst the litigating public, people will not look at it. It has to, of course, be complemented by the courts realizing and the legal and the justice system realizing that this is also an opportunity to offload a whole set of disputes and get them resolved. And conciliation is a great way. Mediation, when it happens as part of the system, is a different issue. But conciliation can definitely happen, and that will be binding. Thank you very much, uh, Siddharth. Uh, well, I must say that uh, this has been a fascinating discussion, and I want to thank each one of you. Before we move to the second segment, I have 111 questions for you. And obviously, I will be taking a few. So I'll, we'll do a round of questions. So let me begin with um, Parag. Parag, there's a question from Sanjay Garg. Sanjay is asking, ADR is fine and definitely provides an alternative and efficient mechanism for dispute resolution. However, how can companies and corporations and business enterprises think of dispute uh, prevention in the court context so that they focus on are based formats even without litigation in the first place and this might be a question which can make some of you you know slightly less employable but still i'm going to ask the question <laughs> so i think i think greater clarity in drafting your agreements greater clarity in your uh, alternative uh, dispute resolution mechanism greater focus on mediation uh, are some of the ways by which you can reduce the chances of ending in a court. Actually, I have a, it's my pet subject, but I'll take half a minute. Uh, we should actually focus more, not merely on arbitration or mediation, but on the concept of medar, which is a little uh, counterintuitive because the same man who does, supposing Mr. Chandyok is the medar, so he will do mediation. And then if it doesn't work out, then he will seamlessly become an arbitrator. Of course, there's an issue there because as a mediator, he will know a lot of stuff which he would never know otherwise as an arbitrator and whether that puts in a bias. But in smaller value disputes, 
that can also be a way out. So you will have to choose a man of trust. Once you trust him, then let him do the medab itself because medab will see to it that the matter is over. But then, of course, that it's, it's great as a theoretical answer. It leaves a lot of ironing out of creases, but it's very doable. And it will make people like me even more unemployed. Thank you very much, uh, Parag, for that candid answer. Um, then is, there is a question from, and there are several questions, uh, some of uh, students uh, who are watching this across the country, uh, Abudaya and Sanjay and Gautam. Uh, this is a question about to what extent law students uh, can be inspired to pursue uh, a, 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 you know, ADR as part of their legal profession aspirations in the sense that uh, the current imagination of legal education in most countries in the world emphasizes transactional work in the law firm context or for that matter litigation work in the uh, court context. Uh, how can law students be inspired to pursue this as a part of their future legal profession? Well, uh, that gives rise to a, another very good reason for taking the word alternate out of alternate dispute resolution, because when you are a transactional lawyer, you are going to be drafting in many, many, many of your commercial agreements, a dispute resolution clause. And indeed, in that context, litigation is just as much an alternative as arbitration. You are going to be drafting that dispute resolution clause by saying either this matter will be resolved by litigation according to the law of, for example, New South Wales, uh, or you're going to be drafting that clause by saying this matter, uh, any dispute arising will be resolved by arbitration and the seat of the arbitration will be X and there'll be three arbitrators or one arbitrator and the language is going to be in English or Hindi. So that uh, indeed uh, that is going to have to be uh, an extraordinary consideration. Secondly, I think in the context of practice and procedure, alternate dispute resolution or dispute resolution or, or complementary dispute resolution is just as important to understand as the process of litigation. And indeed, becoming aware of those issues is going to become increasingly important. And even if you are not uh, studying international law, it will be crucially important to understand the impact of the various treaties and conventions, the New York Convention, of course, it goes without saying, and the Singapore Convention, which is going to become more widespread in its adoption. So that uh, it should be taught and understood and practiced at law school. And I think accreditation in institutions for mediation should be sought out very shortly after uh, one uh, completes one's education in the law at university. Uh, because it is going to become entrenched, it's going to become a part of the dispute resolution culture. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Uh, Pinky, there's a question from uh, uh, Gautam Baskar, and Gautam is asking that, uh, what do you think of the statutory and other general impediments in India, uh, if there are, um, for India to emerge as a hub or seat for international arbitration, and discuss the benefit it might bring. In some ways, there are several questions related to it. You know, why can't we emerge like how Hong Kong and Singapore and even SeaTac in China have over the last decade or so emerged as key arbitral uh, uh, or dispute resolution centers? Uh, I think one of the key questions, uh, in fact, two. Uh, there are two key questions. One is the structural framework of what we today call ADR, and of course, hopefully, we will soon change that terminology around to complementary, supplementary, as Siddharth said, or and some of the other speakers also said. But uh, aside from these structural ones, so therefore the Arbitration Council of India setting up standards, making lawyers available as first line um, arbitrators instead of only as a, as a second line, uh, which comes through post litigation or after litigation uh, as a standalone time. Uh, I think that is one part of it. But the second key question possibly has been, and the reason there has been some resistance uh, has been because ultimately arbitration is subject to judicial process. And there is always a fear of any uh, litigator or uh, 
a person who is a party to the process of law in the concerned country. So if we can ensure, and we have made various inroads into that, to expedite the solution as far as the courts are concerned, and in, a, in its own way to minimize uh, the judicial, uh, call it interference, call it uh, setting aside of awards, or call it the time taken for the judicial process post-arbitration, I think that has been one of the key questions that always confronts any party. And that is why possibly there has been some hesitation, but I think we have made tremendous changes in that direction. And we've made it both in the legislative framework as much as the judicial framework. So legislatively, we have provided for timelines and costs, et cetera, if arbitration is not completed on time. That is one part of it in simplification of process. But at the second level, at the judicial level, I think the courts have been increasingly uh, making the principle of upholding the arbitration award as an essential feature. and. Interference only in the rare cases of perversity, gross illegality, etc. I mean, basic associate builders has laid down the framework and that has been now reinforced from time to time. Even in the recent past, there have been various judgments. So I think that stands in a long way to reinforce the regime uh, in India. And uh, otherwise, India is perfect to be an arbitration hub in all ways because the, the availability, the infrastructure, and, and the cost effectiveness, in fact, of anything which is to be done in India. So really speaking, it is only heightening this uh, belief that India will, will deliver because everybody wants delivery. And that, that I think is way, uh, it's on, on its way and we should possibly just enforce that. And soon we should have, because there's an essential need. Uh, as much as we talked about it, a brief reference was made to the Western world reality and you know, in a sense, uh, ignoring or bypassing the concerns of the third world or the emerging economies. I think you do need to offset that by making itself also India uh, a hub, which it is uh, well on its way to do. Thank you very much, uh, Pinky. Um, Mr. Chandiyog, there are several questions focusing on uh, COVID-19 impact in the arbitration context. And Sanjay is asking that, uh, isn't it important to introduce COVID-19 specific legislation like what Singapore has done so that cases around COVID can be dealt as per new legislation rather than clogging the legal system? Um, even the UK passed the Coronavirus Act as well. And we are still, of course, using our older legislation, including the Disaster Management Act and the, um, uh, and the Diseases Act. Uh, so the question is about, should there be a separate legislative framework to deal with uh, potential future litigation surrounding COVID-19? I think it, uh, the question is important in the context in which we are today. I think you've given two examples of UK as well as of Singapore. Singapore brought about a COVID-19 act and made what was otherwise contractual as force measure, for example. For every kind of default, it brought a force measure by a statute. Therefore, the parties, whether they have agreed or they have not agreed, would not make any difference. Therefore, there's a need today, though we, I see in the construction, for example, construction law, the force measure has been brought in as a concept. But I think it should be around every default or everywhere they are saying. Now, take for example, we are not looking at it from the point of view, though we have given a monitorium, for example, on the interest, but we are saying that the interest for this five months or four months will again be an interest bearing account. So if we bring a common legislation covering everything of all with respect to COVID-19, wherever that, how much time it lasts, nobody knows about that, then we will be able to bring uniformity the people will understand it better. The commercial world will understand it better, whether it is a small businessman or a large business house, knows what kind of advantages we'll have. In fact, you'll see in the last few days, most of the matters are between landlord and tenant going to court, only with respect to the fact that I'm not going to pay rent. I can't pay it. Now, if there was a law with respect to the same, whether it's right or it's wrong is a different question. One will be able to bring uniformity in the implementation of law, irrespective of which field you belong and where do you belong. So it's necessary. I agree with him. There's a need for us to bring a uniform COVID-19 law, even by an ordinance, it's the need of the hour. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chandiyok. Uh, Siddharth, there's a very interesting question from Prachi and uh, uh, Pradeep and uh, Sanjay have also asked the question. Prachi is asking, sir, the major reason for lack of mediation is enforcement of settlement agreement. In light of this, Shouldn't India look for signing the Singapore Convention on Settlement Agreement and potentially uh, make this situation better? I think I agree. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Chindrakar talked about mediation in the context of commercial courts, and I think it's important now that mediation is incorporated as part of our legislative framework. Of course, the treaty would have to be treaty can be acceded to, and even otherwise, it needs to be brought in. These are forces of uh, economics which is going to drive this change. And it is important that we recognize these forces of economics which need, which are, which want this change to come out faster, sooner than faster. People can't litigate. And one another thing which is which I anticipate happening now is that with all this economic disruption, there's going to be a lot more financing of litigation. Once financing of litigation begins to happen, which is permissible under Indian law, except by lawyers, you're going to have people who want to settle and move out. So if we bring in legislatively ordained mediation and accept and become and sign accede to the treaty, then you're going to have the effect is really going to be you're going to make resolution of matters much faster. That's a very important uh, suggestion, and I think it's imperative. I think the government is also. I hope this government is any government should really be looking at the economic impact in terms of litigation uh, litigation resolution. And that's the need of the art. Well, thank you very much, Siddharth. Uh, I, well, I've got now uh, 50 more questions, and I'm barely <laughs> reaching a few. There are several of them are very good. Um, let me move to Parag. Uh, Parag, there's a question about uh, you know regulation surrounding ADR. Uh, the question Sanjay is asking, uh, we need bodies like the Bar Council of India to decide on qualification, training, a code of conduct for mediators, arbitrators. Uh, today, there is not much regulations in this regard. So what kind of leadership that bar can play in creating a regulatory framework for determining in more specific terms uh, the role of uh, uh, arbitrators and mediators? See, the regulate, uh, it's a good question. The regulatory framework in terms of how they set about their work including their qualifications, uh, as far as arbitrators are concerned, is covered under the Arbitration Act of India, Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Yes, uh, the, 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 the bodies of the bar uh, should uh, look into this and come up with their suggestions. Uh, in India, the bodies of the bar have their own peculiar issues, which of course are, are in a way sui generis. Uh, but yes, surely uh, their responses should be there. But I think uh, more than setting out the qualifications, eligibility, etc., it the focus has to be to sweep away litigation from the formal uh, uh, court litigation to this uh, form of dispute resolution. We, we can call it even the main dispute resolution forum. So that you have to shift this from an alternative or a supplementary to a main dispute resolution forum, that the court will be used only initially before the tribunal is set up as a section nine court. And there also, if you have emergency arbitration, you can do away with it, because then your whole load of section nine will shift from the court to the emergency arbitrator who's actually passing nothing more than an ad interim section 17 order. So before the arbitration, during the arbitration, of course, the better is with the arbitrator and subsequently for enforcement. So you, you have to focus more on this. But yes, of course, a, a, a serious look by both scholars and, and our elected bodies uh, on, on how best to go about and what kind of uh, eligibility criteria should be there is always welcome. Thank you very much, Sad. There are several uh, lawyers, uh, advocates from India who are watching this show and they're asking several questions. Without naming them, I'm going to ask this question and I'm going to... Uh, ask this to Dennis because I know um, Dennis, uh, it may be better Dennis to answer this question. It's a slightly more controversial one. Um, so Dennis, the question is that, you know, what's the way forward for having specialized arbitrators and mediators in general, instead of retired high court and Supreme Court judges presiding over arbitrations and mediations, which unfortunately mostly happens in India. And that's the questioner's view. Um, also in the existing scenario, should that be grading of arbitrators depending on the on the performance, which would mean that grading, uh, you know, former judges. The heart of the question is that uh, the, end, the existing arbitration discourse in India is dominated by judges. 
Can you share a bit of uh, experience uh, from Australia and what do you think, uh, you know, what kind of balance we need to have? There are some very good arbitrators who are retired judges in Australia. And they're sought out and they are excellent. Having said that, uh, arbitration is not the exclusive province of retired judges. And indeed, it's not the exclusive province of retired, uh, 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 of lawyers. Uh, uh, and an arbitrator may be chosen for many reasons, not the least of which is that he knows something about the subject matter of the dispute. And that may be whether it's concerning marine law, environmental law, uh, pollution law, uh, resources law, or otherwise, uh, or resources issues and the way contracts are administered. And uh, as a consequence, uh, it should not, and it should never be considered to be the exclusive province of lawyers, let alone retired judges. Um, indeed, there are many retired judges who are as well mediators, and indeed, most are very good at it. But that doesn't mean that that area should be the province of the retired judge. Uh, uh, it, it should be open to everybody because the qualities of a good adjudicator, good arbitrator, a good mediator are to a great degree very personal. Once you learn the process, once you understand the procedure, it's your quality as a decision maker or as a, a mediator assisting the parties to come to a view uh, or to come to an, an agreement uh, that uh, will shine through. And you will acquire your reputation, not because you did a course, but because of your personal qualities and your personal abilities. And that seems to reflect to a great degree the position in Australia, there are many good mediators who are not lawyers. There are many good arbitrators who are not lawyers. Uh, but um, uh, I hope that assists. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Uh, uh, Pinky, there's a question from one of our own students, Swaraj Gupta. Swaraj is asking specifically to you, with recent amendments to arbitration, which were introduced in the Arbitration Council of India, uh, what do you think is the progress regarding it and by when we can see the council in place and working? And a related question is that to what extent there is a need for consensus in the broad legal community when it comes to strengthening the institutional mechanisms for such bodies? Uh, the second one first, what is the consensus? I, I guess in a world like ours, there hardly is ever a consensus. But some of the key points that kind of emerge forward are, yes, it is required. I don't think anybody can really dispute it because in order to make any system efficacious, and that's what we are talking about today, we do need to ensure an institutional support. And from time to time, there has been, for example, the ICA, as we mentioned, the MCIA, as we mentioned. So we do need to have a body to set standards in respect of all, and in particular in today's world, the virtual world, uh, which has come forth as a means of resolution of disputes, uh, whether in the alternative manner or in the non-alternative manner. So I think there's no question which is to be gainsaid, whatever the issues might be in respect of consensus or no consensus, the only way forward is to have institutional support and to expedite that process. Uh, on the first question, it is on way. It does take some time. It is difficult to say what is the kind of time frame, but it should happen fairly soon. There are impediments in terms of COVID-19 and other issues, which obviously uh, stand in the way of uh, expediting these processes. But uh, it is something which is, uh, of course, been established. So the only thing is, how much time it might take, a bit, it'll be there soon. Thank you very much, uh, Pinky. Um, so uh, th there's a question from uh, Sochiro Mondal and uh, Prithvi Raj Sikha. Uh, both of them are asking a very similar question, maybe to uh, Mr. Chandok. Uh, Chandok, the question is that it feels very satisfied to hear how some major key reforms could smoothen the arbitration process. But uh, in terms of the future, uh, what are the ways by which the courts themselves can change their functioning with a view to 
having greater legitimacy and credibility and acceptability of the ADR process. You talked about what lawyers can do, but the heart of this question is that to what extent the existing judicial mechanisms can uh, change their own institutional mindsets with a view to favoring ADR processes. We see the last five years, do not to take you further down, there is already a shift that has taken place, both legislative as well as the mindset with respect to the courts. If you find there was a setting aside of the award or intervention by the court prior to five years or four years, you would find more of, there was more intervention by the court. But here we find in the last, especially in places like Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, and I saw in Bangalore also the other day, I saw the statistics, that the intervention of the court has become very minimum. And now that the guidelines have been provided by the Supreme Court, when will you do so? And the statute has also been amended. The statutory, the framework by the institutions, that is the court is also changing. It looks at it. In fact, it looks at this way. It says, I must accept the award as it is, unless I find this patent illegality. Now that patent illegality is a very difficult question to answer, but the judicial mind will only be able to tell us whether the patent illegality or not. But at the same time, we need to look at more Prag Tirpati and Siddharth and Pinky, etc. should be the arbitrators in place who have been practicing law in, in the subject. I think that's also an important part that we need to look at. People who are practicing, for example, in, tele, in telecommunication, they should be made to become arbitrators also. I am not nothing against the honorable judges. Please don't take it that way. But what I'm saying is time has come where actual practitioner in that branch of law is requested to become the arbitrator. It will be much better, much faster, and even that so-called patent illegality that we are looking at under the statute, you will not find because he'll be able to address that issue himself because he's gone through it and he knows update what the position. Because our problem with the bar is also this. When we thought we should bring a learning process after every 10 years or five years to renew our license, we all came in up in arms. It's time that we must learn every day. And that is where I think the, even the judicial system needs to learn every day. We can't be with your set examples with respect to that. But the only suggestion I can make is if the person practicing in that branch of law is made an arbitrator, you will find more or better arbitration awards being written and probably lesser intervention even by the court. But there's already a mindset change by the court. If you see the statistic even from Delhi High Court, you'll find how many awards have been not been even set aside by the court. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chandiyok. Siddharth, there's a question about uh, financing and sale of arbitration claims as a necessary yet legitimate byproduct for COVID-19. A related aspect of this is that uh, uh, how this COVID-19 has affected the ADR system and to what extent there is scope for these current challenges to move towards an online dispute resolution mechanism. We did cover this before, but there's a question from Subramanian Sarkar um, Ganesh, please. Uh, under Indian law, under Order 25, there are some state amendments which allow financing of claims. It is important to understand that keeping in with the disruption, the economic disruption that has happened, parties with valid claims are not able to afford arbitration because arbitration has costs which are greater than in court. That is the arbitration. There is the arbitrator's fees, there is the institutional fees, it's as, and all of these add up to costs. There is, of course, a situation where things may get, the fees may have to be modified because of online, the travel costs and all are reduced, but that cost remains. And with companies and corporate entities and individuals unable to meet basic expenses of running their businesses, there will be greater opportunities for people to finance litigations, which, as I said, is legitimate. Once that happens, arbitration is a much more stable environment for people to move ahead because you know there are time-bound results. Your legislation requires a a resolution within a stipulated time. There is also a bonus, a benefit, so to speak, if the legis if the decision comes before that. It's a unique system in India where you get an added fee for doing it before time. So with that kind of an environment, I think today this area of development, and this will provide an ecosystem for financial institutions, for a whole set of lawyers who will be able to front this nature of litigation. 
keeping both interests in mind. That's part one. The second part is because ODR is available, it makes it a lot more possible and people can also visually see. So the third party can also enter under the CPC. Of course, they can be made parties to the dispute, but they have right of access to see what is happening and they have that extent of access to, to the resolution process. I think it's, it's something which we have to look at very closely and the developments that are going to happen in this area are something which will provide great opportunities, not just for the arbitration space, but definitely for members of the bar, because today we are going to have to step down. Otherwise, as I see it, conventional litigation is going to be handicapped by lack of systems. And it is important for young lawyers, especially, to start looking at opportunities beyond what I said was complementary dispute resolution and not alternate dispute resolution. Thank you very much, Siddharth. Uh, while I have um, 100 plus unanswered questions, we are coming to the end of this uh, fascinating colloquium. Uh, let me ask my last question to all the panelists here. Uh, this is a standard question for all of you. For those students of law who are watching this program, what would you like to tell them as they experience this extraordinary crisis along with their studies in law school with greater demands of justice created in times of this pandemic? How will their future careers in law and justice be impacted? What kind of expectations and hopes that the graduating students of law need to uh, be prepared for? What specific steps should the students be interested in ADR take to become future effective arbitrators, mediators, and conciliators? Parag, begin the last, this question, please. Uh, I'm still hunting for that magic potion. <laughs> <laughs> which I would recommend to all of them to take. I think the same principle which you need to be successful at the bar. Work very hard. Don't be obsessed with what your peer group is doing and achieving. Maintain your integrity. Success follows. That is the traditional and, believe you me, effective way of growing. For the students of today, because the options are very much more, uh, do a lot of reading. Most of us are unable to do that for various reasons. But inculcate a love for reading because ultimately when you read a wide range of law and non-law subject, it affects the way you function, not only as a human being, but also as a litigator or an arbitrator or a person who, who is a thinker as to how and where the society and how and where dispute resolution should go. Thank you very much, Parag. I want to add that Parag has been a very distinguished uh, professor at Jindal and he has uh, taught full-fledged semester-long courses, leaving part of his practice and actually teach every week on <laughs> campus. I'm grateful to Parag for that. Dennis, the same question to you. Thank you. Uh, in your studies, there are a couple of fundamentals. One is you uh, do not lose sight of the rule of law. And secondly, you do not lose sight that you are by and large practicing in a democratic system uh, with uh, separation of power. And one of the fundamental precepts of, a, uh, of those kinds of systems is that you have an open justice system. Think about that in the context of uh, alternate dispute resolution. Think about it in the context of procedures uh, in court going online and think about it in terms of uh, other forms of dispute resolution, namely arbitration and mediation, which occur by agreement between the parties. And once you keep those kind of fundamentals at the top of your head, it's pretty simple to continue uh, study and to include in my view, compulsorily, uh, systems of dispute resolution, including arbitration and mediation. And uh, you'll become well-rounded as a consequence. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Pinky. I actually feel a lot for the law students. I'll tell you that in the first instance. I think there is immense anxiety and possibly legitimately so as to the future because you know you are coming out and you expected this grandstand to be available and that may for the time being not be available. 
So what is a further step forward is, is the key question. Uh, I'm afraid there are no ready answers. Uh, there is, justice has always been there and justice will always remain as part, an essential part of the Indian uh, system. So I don't think that it should be any anxiety in the long term. These are short term issues where issues have come up uh, regarding COVID-19 and hopefully uh, there will be a way out of it as soon as possible. What the time frame is, I don't think anybody can say. But uh, looking forward to a brighter future, I think we can engage ourselves for the time being in various activities which would lend ourselves to becoming better human beings, some of which Parag has said, uh, and some of it as better as better lawyers and some of it as better technologists, if I may use that expression. Uh, of course, the current generation is well aware of the technology and I don't think we need to tell them anything. We are the ones who are actually learning these processes. But to adapt uh, oneself to a different way of life, to look at these alternate situations that have come, not alternative dispute resolution, but the alternate uh, situations that have come and how to address them and actually to reinvent ourselves as lawyers. I mean, we had become established in a particular manner of uh, litigation, call it, or legalhood, as you call it. But we really need to think of ourselves as a yet another lawyer. So it's not the success possibly in a case, but the success of resolution of the dispute, which is ultimately important, and how that dispute is relatable to economic revival, economic growth, uh, and social growth. I think the human rights issues are also very crucial to and endemic to the uh, entire question. So as lawyers and as young budding lawyers and as law students, uh, don't worry, it is, nothing is going away forever. Yes, there is some transitional period, but in the meantime, we do need to dig our heels in and stay there. Thank you very much, uh, Pinky. Uh, Mr. Sandiok. Well, I would only say that I think they have one more opportunity and that opportunity that I can offer straight away to them is people like me will be their students not only with respect to law and what new innovations or principles of law, are, but at least on technology. So they should actually be teaching me how will I use this new system that virtual hearing, etc. They'll be my teacher. So they have better opportunity qua me, qua people like me and people of maybe, even, I'm not saying uh, Prague or for that matter, Siddharth or Pinky, but I'm speaking purely for myself. Because there are people that this is a greater opportunity for law students to look at. And I think the great greatest opportunity for them at all times was that if a lawyer is a great human being, he understands, he gets that compassion, empathy, and knows to read his statute apart from what actually Prague said, to read something else because 75% must be other than law. Your opportunities will not diminish you. Please don't get COVID-19 to hamper you in any way. You have an extremely bright future and notwithstanding that we have 11,000 people who have registered as lawyers in the 2019-20 as the Bar Council of Delhi tells me. Yet, the opportunities are larger. There are more avenues available to you. There are more things that are available to you. More law has been created. More disputes are coming. And COVID-19 certainly will give you more disputes. Even if you have to resolve them, still you need the legal background. Therefore, if your fundamentals are clear, you are a good human being. I'm sure your future is extremely bright. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sandhyog, for that really optimistic note. Uh, uh, Siddharth. I think, uh, <clears throat> I wish I could be that optimistic. I think it's, but it's time for students to innovate, innovate and innovate. There are opportunities. They need to look beyond the conventional paths of the profession. For example, there are now persons, a category of persons and observers who will be required to look at recording of evidence. That's an opportunity which is going to be newly created, lawyers as observers. They must, students must also develop their inner creativity, work at their inner creativity, research, read, write, look seriously at research and academics. These are, I think, going to be great areas to develop. They're going to be great opportunities. Seek experience, not just remuneration subject to your being able to afford it. Gain experience because right now, in this time, it's experience that's going to matter. It's not going to be just the remuneration. And lastly, <clears throat> I believe that on a positive note, there is going to be an exponential increase in the need for adjudicators, for mediators, for conciliators. Focus on that. Reach out to Mr. Chindyok, to Mr. Wilson, to Pinky. They'll tell you, Parag, they'll tell you where to go. And I think that area, in my view, is going to be the new area of development in law, and that's going to provide a lot of opportunities for young lawyers. All the best. 
Thank you very much, Siddharth. Uh, what a fascinating uh, panel discussion we could have because of the illustrious presence of these very distinguished lawyers. I want to begin by thanking uh, my friends and indeed mentors who have been part of this panel. Um, on a more lighter note, it is quite extraordinary and rare to get these uh, uh, busy lawyers uh, to do non-billable work in the form of being part of this colloquium. I'm grateful to them for being always ready and willing to be part of Jindal Global Law School and OP Jindal Global University's initiatives. I appreciate their candor, their integrity, but also their lifelong contribution to the legal profession. Their commitment and dedication was reflected all through the discussion and the kind of uh, uh, optimistic and futuristic note that they stuck, I'm sure resonates very well with the students and the lawyers and others who have watched this program. So thank you once again, uh, Parag and Dennis and uh, uh, Siddharth and Mr. Chandiyok and of course, Pinky. I also want to thank Live Law for partnering with us as a knowledge partner in this uh, program. Uh, normally, I do two colloquiums in a week, and but today is quite exceptional. It's almost like a super Saturday. Uh, just when we finish this colloquium at 6.30 p.m., we have the second colloquium for the day, which is the panel discussion on continuing legal education in India and United States of America, upgrading the legal profession. And we are also launching the online LLM in corporate and financial law at Jindal Global Law School, the first and only such program. Of course, the classes will begin uh, more in August, September, but we are beginning the launch today. We're going to be having Ms. Barry Chase, who's the director of the CLE Institute programs at the New York County Lawyers Association. We also have Honorable Mr. Justice Matthew Cooper, Judge of the Supreme Court of New York, who will be joining us. We have Mr. Haigreev Ketan, the Managing Partner of Ketan & Company, Mr. Falgun Kompali, Co-Founder of Upgrad, Mr. Ronnie Skruwala, the Co-Founder and Executive Chairman of Upgrad, Ms. Pallavi Shroff, Managing Partner of Shardul Amachan Mangaldas. All of them will be joining me at 6.30 p.m. this evening to discuss continuing legal education and the future notes of upgrading the legal profession in India and US. With those words, I once again want to thank all the viewers and of course, the distinguished uh, speakers and panelists uh, for participating in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.